Hello and a warm welcome to today's update. It's Thursday the 13th of October. Going to be looking at uh, COVID mostly today, a bit about the international situation. But I'm going to start off with the ZOE data. Um, the ZOE scientists have given me permission to uh, show this data straight off again this week, so that's excellent. And we'll look at the symptoms first of all. Now, th these are the COVID symptoms. We know it's mostly BA5. And the sheer stability of these symptoms is actually really quite encouraging. They've been much the same. OK, they were varied by points of a percent or a percent or two over the past few weeks. But the consistency is good. It means that the data consistency is good. It's being accurately collected, I believe. And the second thing is it means that the, the infection is becoming more predictable for the vast majority of people. Uh, this is now a relatively mild condition with the following symptoms. Now, these symptoms are based on people that have tested positive, so we can be pretty confident about the accuracy of them. So of the people that test positive, 64% have a sore throat. This is the main feature now. So if you've got a sore throat, it could well be. It could well be a COVID SARS coronavirus 2 infection. Um, and if you have a SARS coronavirus 2 infection, 64% of the time you will get a sore throat is what this is saying. Although it's still more likely if you've got symptoms, you'll have a common cold than SARS coronavirus 2 at the moment. But for those diagnosed positive, sore throat 64%, runny nose, headache. These are just classic upper respiratory cold type symptoms. Um, blocked nose 52%. Cough with no phlegm, a non-productive cough, 52%. Sneezing, 47%. Cough uh, that is productive, 46%. What I always find when I have infections is I start off with a bit of a cough, maybe, that's not very productive, and then it becomes more productive over time. So often more productive as time goes on, as your chest sort of clears out any any, any residual uh, products of inflammation that, that might be... a uh, that might be there in excess sputum, etc. Mucus, rather. Uh, well, I suppose mucus becomes sputum. Anyway, a cough with phlegm, hoarse voice, 44%. Muscle pains, aches, 29%. Fatigue. Fatigue, not as big a symptom as it was, but, but still there. A lot of people, 23% getting undue fatigue. Lightheadedness, dizziness, 21%. Altered smell, 20%. Swollen neck glands, the lymphadenopathy, 18%. Sore eyes, chest pain. Shortness of breath, great to see shortness of breath is down to 16% because of this, of course, was the cause of many of the hospitalizations. Loss of smell, 14%. Earache, that was out of order, 15%. Uh, chills or shivers, 13%. Joint pain. And quite a few people recently started complaining of a bit of shoulder pain. So good stability there, indicating that really this, we really are coming into the endemic phase now. Uh, that the risks from COVID are way down for most people, more of an inconvenience than anything else. Now, this is a useful graphic here. What this graphic does is this graphic is comparing the likelihood of having, if you have common cold symptoms, the likelihood of having COVID and the likelihood of having a common cold. So we see if it's a common cold, it's more likely. The orange is common cold symptoms and the uh, the blue is the COVID symptom. So we see it's at least twice as likely. If you have symptoms, it's a common cold compared to COVID. But of course, it does still mean there's a lot of COVID around. It most certainly hasn't gone away, and unfortunately, it's not going to for some time into the future. It's going to be endemic. But at the moment, more likely, if you have symptoms, to be a common cold than COVID, although both should be considered, of course. Now, this is the day-by-day -day evolution of the condition that we've seen, and we do see it's going up, but more gradually. So it's looking like this wave here is not going to reach anything like these higher waves of the Omicron, um, the Omicron infection, or the Omicron waves, as we could call them. And, um, of course, this is people that are symptomatic, day-by-day -day evolution of the infection across the UK. Now, there's a full report here from the Zoe Data Scientists. Um, do download it. Um, one of the reasons I, I like to do this is I can understand everything in the report. It's completely transparent, written in very simple English with good graphics. Uh, and, and, it, and it's all there. It's all above board. So very transparent. Uh, we're not going to mention anyone that's less than transparent at the moment. This is a positive video today. So good to see that. New symptomatic cases yesterday, the 11th were, uh, no, no, this is two days ago. This was the 11th. Uh, 
235,829. So it's pretty high. It's still a lot of people getting new symptomatic COVID. And this is based on uh, testing. Um, over 3 million people is the current prevalence to have it. That's one in 22 people in the UK. So it's still a lot of people around. So that's the report there. Uh, download it, check it out for yourself. I've put the links, of course. Now, these are the new uh, daily cases here. And we see the new cases are just starting to level off by the looks of it. But the R value there is one. So we have an R value at the moment of about one. So that's pretty, pretty well level, isn't it? Um, each new case is on average generating one further new case. And I'm expect, I, I think it's likely, given the trends we're seeing, that that is going to drop below one pretty soon. Although the scientists are saying one to 1.1. So they are saying that one is the lower probability at the moment. But it look, look, looking like the trend is down, which, which, which is good because it's only October. So this is quite encouraging, really, for winter, in the UK at least. Uh, across the nations, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, not much in it. OK, Scotland's a bit, little bit lower now, but it's been higher at other times. I don't really put much uh, store by Well, it's accurate data, but I don't see it's particularly relevant. It's just variation. The trends are much the same. They are very similar trends. Uh, likewise, the various regions. OK, London is the green line there. You might be able to see it is a bit lower, but it's been higher in the past. Probably means that a lot of people had infections in London at an earlier stage and more immunity has already been generated, which, of course, is a good thing. <clears throat> now, um, daily incidents across the age group. So we did see that the younger people here peaked fairly high gave it to the next generations they're now going down because they're back from back at school and they had chance to get colds from colds and covid from each other as children and young people do slight concern there is that the purple line which is the over 75s is going up um now i say a slight concern there because at the moment uh, less than 40 percent of the people that are admitted to hospital in the uk with covid are admitted for COVID. In other words, 60% at the moment are incidental findings. As, as, as you would expect, of course, as we move, as we move towards the endemic, as, as we move towards the endemic situation. So a slight proviso there, but nothing really too concerning at the moment. Uh, new cases of people living with long COVID. Now, this is based on the people getting COVID now. Uh, who are likely to develop long COVID lasting for more than 12 weeks. But this is based on data from 2021. And, and the Zoe scientists appreciate this, of course. We have, I have discussed this personally with them. So these are the most pessimistic scenarios, really. If, if, if this number of people were getting, were getting a Delta way back in the bad days of Delta, then that's the number of long COVID cases we would expect. But because we're not in the Delta, we're in the Omicron, we've got much more immunity knocking around. Therefore, the the number is going to be quite a bit less than that. So I would see this number of 4,000 a day as being an absolute maximum. The real number could well be, well, we're speculating, we don't have the data, but the real number could well be half that. We, we simply don't know, but it could well be half that. Um, incidents of cold-like illnesses. This, so this is just people with colds, basically. Uh, we see that the younger people who've uh, now gone back to school, acquired some immunity, are getting less colds. <laughs> this is just uh, exactly what you would expect. But of course, the difference here is we actually have the data to back it up. So it's not speculation. This is based on actually empirical data. So uh, good to see that less people in the UK are, are getting uh, snivels. Uh, although that, I don't want to demean colds. Um, if you get a, a bad cold, you can be pretty knocked off for quite a few days, actually. And it can take a week or two to recover. If it's a bad viral infection, even if it's only in the upper respiratory compartment, it still makes you feel uh, a bit off because you, you get these inflammatory cytokines, even with a common cold that absorb into the body. And you do get, you can feel um, symptomatic, systematically uh, fa fairly unwell. Um, you, can, you can get this sort of overall uh, malaise with, with a cold really quite... Uh, well, I don't mean me to tell you what it's like to have a cold. You can have a bad one. International COVID situation... Now, um, this is um, new cases per million, um, which isn't particularly useful. Um, it just reflects the testing. But we do see that the huge spike in South Korea has gone down 
as indeed has it has in Japan. So South Korea and Japan had big spikes, as you might remember, a few months ago, but they're really down quite nicely now. And South Korea and Japan, of course, are testing a lot more than we do here. So um, that is accurate. Good to see they've got over that. A uh, number of COVID patients in hospital per million. Well, again, uh, you can't see that in detail there, but we do see it's lower. But here we have a bit of a blow up of that. And we see that Canada has got a bit of a, Canada's had a bit of an increase in hospitalizations. The UK, slight increase. This is Japan, which is going way down, which is good to see. Then Ireland, United States, Australia, South Korea. But of course, there's a very important proviso on the data for hospitalizations. And this is shown from this UK data here. Now, this is from the Office for National Statistics. And this is the proportion of people in hospital who are admitted for COVID. And we see it's actually just under 40%. So the majority of people in hospital with COVID are admitted for something else. Only 40% are admitted with COVID. So that means when we look at these figures here, these international figures, at least for the UK, we can say with certainty that less than 40% of those are admitted for COVID. The others are incidental findings. They just happen to have COVID or happen to pick it up in hospital. And uh, because people have a large degree of immunity now, we are, as a population, we are not naive to this infection anymore. It's much less concerning than it was. The risks have changed. Uh, now, deaths per million. The um, thing to notice here is the United States are still the worst. Now, I'm not going to look at them in detail. You can't, you can't, don't think I've got a blow up. You know, but no, you haven't. Um, the United States, still the highest. So the United States, Canada, Ireland, Australia, Japan, South Korea, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, in that order for deaths so i get probably thousands of comments people from the united states who say yeah our our our, our lifestyle is bad our diet is bad in the states now it's not brilliant in the uk by any means um, but we do eat probably on average slightly less processed food and lower calorie food than the united states this really does need to be a wake-up call for lifestyle and diet in the united states Time to start eating less sugar and processed fats and processed foods and eat more plants, just to give some very basic advice. Now, I'm going to do some, I'm doing some more work on this in the moment, but I'm just going to give you some provisional work here. This is from the Office for National Statistics, and this is excess deaths. And we see that excess deaths are still high. Now, of course, we had a lot of excess deaths here. The blue deaths are COVID deaths. We expected that during the uh, extreme waves of COVID. And you notice here uh, that this dotted line here is the five-year average, that deaths here were below the five-year average. But this was altered by the fact that they were so high in uh, previous years. So basically what we are seeing is for some time now, and here's a bit of a blow up of that, deaths have been above the five-year average so the five-year average is this the, the, these are data dropouts due to various reasons but the um the the, the black line there is the five-year average of deaths that we would expect and here here we know it's higher because of the high cases of covid in the previous two seasons um, even here um, ex there's more deaths than we would expect now the blue deaths there are attributable to covid that's what we expect but now we are still seeing these excess deaths um, due to, well, we basically don't know. But we do know that only the blue ones are COVID. And these others are excess deaths for basically unknown reasons. So we are still getting more people dying than we would expect. And given the magnitude of this problem that we have looked at in previous videos, it's surprising there's not more coverage uh, on it. Um, I'm not going to rehearse the possible causes for this at the moment, but uh, do, do look forward to future uh, videos on that because I really quite see this as quite significant, uh, quite significant data. We have excess deaths compared to what we would expect. And as you see, that data goes up to September 20. 22. So COVID wise, you've got the list of symptoms. Now I'm going to post all of those, of course, on the um, on the uh, description. 
Now, um, just going to do a quick with uh, what's going on with the Zoe work now. This is research after COVID um, that uh, you can become uh, involved in if you would uh, like. I'm certainly involved in it. Uh, now, I stress I have no financial interest in this whatsoever. It's purely scientific. But it's not even scientific. It's just to try and help people. This is, this is collecting medical data that can save lives. It's, it's as simple as that. And it's easy to do. A lot of it is app-based. So do check it out for yourself. Do download the app. Just a bit of a taster. Uh, Tim Spector here uh, is talking about... Uh, life after covid so he's talking about things like he's doing research on dementia um heart disease um, co co just basically common diseases but these common diseases can be completely debilitating you now if someone's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes when they're 40 and die when they're 80 that's 40 years of having to manage this really really pretty inconvenient to put it mildly disease um at worst people can be admitted can go blind can develop kidney failure can develop uh, necrotic limbs it is a terrible disease and this is what we're working to try and uh, reduce so do join in uh, simply by giving data so um check on that for that video and tim will explain it in more detail just to whet your appetite the big diet study which i'm about to give my data for um, is being done now great logos of course as always from from zoe um launching the big diet study uh, to get involved with that and another another study coming intermittent fasting there's a lot of talk about intermittent fasting is it right for you well um i'm not going to tell you now <laughs> um I suppose the answer is for some of you and not for others so much. But uh, th th there's a podcast on it there that you can listen to on the latest research on um, intermittent fasting, which, of course, is quite uh, is quite popular. So um, medical research goes on. Uh, part of the reason I'm supporting this and involved in this myself um, is that it is cheap. We're collecting a lot of really important medical information but it's not randomized controlled trials and it's not controlled by anyone who's trying to sell us anything. It is just uh, scientific medical data for the sake of science and for the sake of helping people, not anyone trying to sell us anything, whether it be pots and pans, clothes pegs, or indeed uh, medications. So there we go. Plenty to be going on with if you take an interest in that. And for now, thank you for watching.